We are thankful for your presence with us this morning. If you are visiting with us in person this morning, we ask that you stop at our visitor cart to my right on your way out and sign our guest book and pick up a, a welcome bag. It will tell you more about the life and ministry of Eastminster. We have several welcomes this morning. We want to welcome Steve Vance and thank him so much for being with us today. We're very grateful for you being here. We also want to welcome Sherilyn Hicks and thank her for being with us to accompany the choir and accompany us in worship this morning. Just a reminder about our mask policy. Yeah, see everybody with their masks this morning. Thank you, thank you. Um, we do ask that when you enter the building and are up moving about that you do have your mask on. And once you're seated with your family, you're welcome to take that off. But we do appreciate everyone doing their best to try to keep everyone safe during this time. Following worship today, our youth who are going to be going through confirmation and a parent and our mentors are going to be gathering to talk about kicking off our confirmation year. And we are super excited about that. Um, we are going to meet right behind us in that classroom um, right after worship today. We ask that all of you in the congregation be in prayer for us as we begin that process. We have eight youth who have signed up to participate in confirmation, and we are very, very excited about the coming year. And I had a message from Carol Eirich, and she wanted me to share this with you. She says she has heard that some are concerned about the women's luncheon next week regarding how things are going to be set up. And she wanted me to please let everyone know that, um, that the tables will be set up to eat out in this area, not in the kitchen, so that there will be plenty of room for social distancing um, for the luncheon. Following the church policy, she said everyone will be asked to wear their mask when moving about, but of course you can take your mask off to eat your lunch, and all the servers will be wearing masks and gloves. Wednesday is the last day to sign up for the luncheon. Um, if you want to sign up today, there will be people at the table um, in the welcome area right after worship, and they can get you signed up as well. Lizzie Bieber, the executive director of United Ministries, will be the speaker for that luncheon, and she will be telling us all about what is going on with United Ministries, including the Interfaith Hospitality Network, which is formerly GAIN. And so we look forward to that. I do have several more announcements, so sorry. Um, if you were not here last Sunday, we blessed our backpacks for the new school year. And so if you were not here, there are backpack tags in the gray bowl on the communion table. There are also red hearts for everyone in the congregation. So as you are leaving today, come up and take a heart. On that heart is a name of a student or a child in our congregation, and we ask that you pray specifically for that person throughout the year. So be sure and grab one um, on your way out today. Okay, hold on, let's see. Youth will meet tomorrow night on Zoom at 7 o'clock. We look forward to checking in and hearing how the first week of school went for everybody or the second week for some of our friends. And please continue to pray for our pastor nominating committee. Um, the prayer concerns that I know of today are um, Lila Childs, a seven-year-old who is going through chemo. She just had her big seven-day treatment in the hospital and is still there. Mary Kathleen Duncan, um, associate pastor at Westminster, is undergoing treatments for breast cancer. We continue to pray for Barbara Curta and her family. Um, as her brother Jerry passed away. We continue to pray and offer prayers of thanksgiving for Sybil and Bonnie as they are going through training for Stephen's ministry leadership um, for our congregation. We are so very, very thankful for their commitment and the way they have stepped forward to lead us in this way. We continue to pray for Cynthia Sims' mom, Miss Bertha Rankin. Um, I did talk to Cynthia this week and her mom is doing really well. We continue to offer prayers for Carol and Ed Eirich, who are both recovering from COVID. Um, I think they will be out of quarantine the first of this week. We do um, continue to pray for doctors and nurses and staff at hospitals, as hospitals at this time are maxed out with patients. Um, and from what I understand, most of them are young. 
um, mid 40s and younger. So please continue to pray for folks um, who are in the hospitals and for all of our medical staff. I mean, I would ask that we continue to pray for teachers and staff. What a first week of school. Nothing like tornadoes on the first day. Um, it was quite the beginning of a new school year. So we are all doing our best to keep folks safe and healthy, but I know we would all appreciate your prayers. Um, and on a personal note, um, I would ask for prayers for Chris and myself and our family. Chris's Aunt Louise, Dr. Louise Clark, was diagnosed with cancer two weeks ago on Thursday, and she passed away Friday morning. Um, and it was quite a shock for all of us. Louise was the one, as we say, that was the one that tied the family together. And um, Chris was able to get to Alabama and was able to see Louise briefly, and she did know that he was there. And so we are thankful for that. But we would appreciate your prayers um, in the days ahead for our family. Um, other prayer concerns that I know of are for Russ Taylor, um, Chris King, Carolyn Walton, Bev Woodruff, Janet Sidebottom. We continue to pray for Kenny Hughes's father, the Dixon son-in-law, Pat. And one that I was given this morning is Wayne Munn, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina. He has a pending surgery, a very, very serious neck surgery, and he is 80 years old. This is John Taylor's cousin, and John has asked for prayers. Are there other prayer concerns that we want to share this morning? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Rebecca Drake and also Christian Drake have been working on Rebecca and Christian Drake, um, son and son and law and daughter, are um, experiencing COVID. Um, so please pray for them. Um, there is just much to pray for. So let us pray for all of those. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it as we have come to worship God. stand for the call to worship. We gather to offer praise for the wonderful works of God. Even before we speak, God knows us completely. The Holy One knows us and sustains us even in our moments of confusion and doubt. Who can count the thoughts of God? They are more than all the sands of the desert. Like clay in the hand of the potter, we are shaped in the vessels of divine will. We come and we praise for the wonderful works of God.
God knows the lengths we go to pursuing our foolish desires. God knows the unwise choices we make each day. Yet, God knows the power of Christ working in us so that we might discover the richness of God's mercy. As we confess using the prayer printed in your worship guide and on the screen, let us pray together. Too often, Lord God, we are hesitant in our proclamation, seeking safe and suitable opportunities to speak of our faith. Too often, Lord God, we are half-hearted in our service, reluctant to stand out from the crowd or to attract criticism. Too often, Lord God, we live as if dependent wholly on our own resources, relying on our perceived skills and modest insights. Too often, Lord God, we look to the clouds for our inspiration in the vain hope of finding you there. Forgive the poverty of our thoughts and the frailty of our faith and open wide our hearts and minds to the imminent presence of our risen living and ascending Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Hear the good news. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are made new and free from our sin. We are made in Christ. Since through Christ we are forgiven, friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. than we did last year. Did y'all have more children? Because a lot of students who did virtual school last year came back. So it was a good reminder about being kind because there were people at my school who had never been there before, a lot of them. And there might have been at your school too. And so they didn't know where to go and they didn't know what to do and there were so many people. And it was a good reminder that we have a job to do in being kind. So let's read this story. Be kind. Tanisha spilled grape juice yesterday all over her brand new dress. Everyone laughed. I almost 
almost did too, but Mom always tells me to be kind. So I tried. I don't think it worked though, because I said, purple's my favorite color. Ugh. I thought Tanisha would smile, but instead she ran to the hall. When she came back, snack time was over, and she put on her art smock, and she didn't look at anyone. I almost told Tanisha that art was my favorite class, but I didn't want her to leave again, so I painted purple splotches and added some green until I had a beautiful bunch of violets. And while I painted, I thought about Tanisha. Should I have handed her my napkin? Or maybe let her borrow my sweatshirt? Or maybe I should have just spilled juice so everyone stared at me instead. What does it mean to be kind anyway? Maybe it's giving. Like making cookies for Mr. Rinaldi who lives all alone. Or maybe it's letting someone with smaller feet have my too tight shoes. He might win races in them too, like I did. Maybe it's helping put dirty dishes in the sink or cleaning up after Otis, our class guinea pig. He's a real messy eater. Maybe it's paying attention, telling Desmond I like his blue boots and asking the new girl at school to be my partner. Maybe it's listening to Aunt Franny's stories, even the ones I've heard a hundred times before. Being kind should be easy, like throwing away a wrapper or recycling a bottle or saying thank you or bless you when someone sneezes. Mom says the quickest way to be kind is to use someone's name. Like, hey Carla, what's new Omar? Or good afternoon Rabbi Montalban. Being kind though can be hard. Even when you know what to do, Teaching someone something I'm good at is tricky. Her little brother's getting food all over her book. Even when I'm patient, it's hard. And sticking up for someone when other kids aren't kind is really hard. And sometimes it can be scary. Maybe I can't solve Tanisha's grape juice problem and maybe all I can do is sit by her in art class and paint this picture for her because I do know she likes purple too. Maybe I can only do small things, but my small things might join small things other people do and together they could grow into something really big, like something really big, so big that all of our kindnesses will just spill out of our school and spread throughout our town and travel across the country and go all the way around the world. Right back to Tanisha and me, so we can be kind again and again and again and again. So look, she gave Tanisha the painting, didn't she? And look what Tanisha did with it. What'd she do with it? She took it home and hung it up. It made her feel a lot better, didn't it? So being kind is not so hard. And when we do something kind, someone next to us might see us and they might decide to do something kind. And then someone else and someone else, because you know what? This world needs some kindness. And I believe that kindness starts with people just like you. Because I think us grown-ups learn from watching you. So I'm going to pray that this week you guys do some really cool, kind things. And next Sunday you can tell me about them. How does that sound? Sound pretty good? Okay, let's pray together, okay? Dear God, thank you for the ways you teach us about love and kindness and sharing. Help us look for ways that we can share kindness wherever we go. Amen. Thanks, boys. Y'all are amazing.
it is a, um, it's an honor to be with you all today. I see um, lots of familiar faces and I see new faces as well. And it is a treat to be back in a congregation that um, means a lot to me. And uh, thank you for inviting me to fill in for Beth. Beth is one of my friends and we share the same neighborhood in Ringo. We've known each other for a long time and I'm glad that I can help her um, have some time off as well. It's always nice to be invited back to a congregation. I know some churches wouldn't invite some pastors back. <laughs> so I, I appreciate your nerve and your uh, welcome. So thank you very much. Before we read scripture, let us ask for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light upon the path that we tread. May your spirit enlighten us and our hearts and the life we share together as disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning's text comes from the second half of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. But you can't really read the second half without reading the first half. I'm not quite sure why the lectionary broke it up that way, but they did. But listen to this text and its preamble. The entirety of chapter 12, one of the great texts in Paul's greatest theological writing, his letter to the Romans. You know it, you've heard it before. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think too much of yourselves, more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned you. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each one of us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence compassionate in cheerfulness. And now today's text. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. 
Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals upon their heads. And finally, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, what do you want to be when you grow up? Ever been asked that question? Sure you have, when you were about maybe five or six. I think that's when my grandparents asked me that question. Stevie, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to be a, a fire, a fireman. And I lusted after a red fire engine in the toy store window. You know, little kids are always asked that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? College graduates are too. Just this past May, a graduating class was asked that very question. It sounds crazy to ask a question of young men and young women who have completed their 17th, 18th, 19th year of formal education. They've satisfied majors. They've earned bachelor's and master's and graduate degrees in a variety of academic endeavors, medical, technical. These are no youngsters sitting at their grandparents' knee. Or are they? What do you want, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's really a great question. It's a question that goes to the heart of human identity. What kind of person do we want to be? Do you want to be? Do I want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? In the context of the church, it's a question that we should ask ourselves quite frequently. In fact, you all are asking yourself that through your pastor nominating committee because you are in the, just about to present yourself to candidates who will be feeling God's pull toward you. And they will want to know, who are you? Who is Eastminster Presbyterian Church? It's a question that congregations need to ask of themselves more often than they do. Because for the Apostle Paul, all of us, should be growing into the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. In the fourth chapter of his letter to the church in Ephesus, which, by the way, predates this Romans text, but follows it in the body, in the biblical order, he says the gifts of Christ, the gifts that Christ gave to the church were that some would be apostles, some would be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the
the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the maturity of the stature of Jesus Christ himself. Paul is painting a picture, not only in this text from Ephesians, but in Romans, of what a mature Christian community looks like. And he's not talking about a visual image. He's not talking about how handsome or attractive we are. He's talking about behavior. He's talking about how mature Christians act, what mature Christians do. He was alone on a road trip. He was alone. It would end 13,000 miles and three months later. He had lost his teaching job and his marriage was on the rocks. He was trying to find himself. He was trying to right his ship. And this road trip away from the interstates, he wasn't going to drive on any divided, controlled access highways, it was going to be his therapeutic exercise and journaling his discipline. On one particular evening, he stopped for dinner at a restaurant in Shelbyville, Kentucky, on US 60, just east of Louisville on the way to Frankfurt. He was waiting for a table to be cleared for him when a well-dressed couple invited him to join them at their table. And he took them up on that offer. We talked, he says, and I sat there waiting for the question. It got there just before the celery and the olives. So what do you do? The husband asked. I told my lie. They didn't need the sword of truth. We didn't have all night. I turned it into a joke and then I gave an answer way too long. As I talked, the man took a pair of forks and a spoon and a knife and put them into a lever system that changed directions twice before it lifted his salad plate off the surface of the table. He said to me, I noticed that you use the word work and job interchangeably. You oughtn't to do that, he said. You see, a job is what you force yourself to pay attention to for money. With work, you don't have to force yourself. There are a lot of jobs in this country, he said, and that's good because it keeps people occupied. And that's why they're called occupations, you know. And then his wife interrupted. Cal works for General Electric in, um, in Louisville. He's a metallurgical engineer. No, honey, he said, I don't work there. I'm employed there. Turning back to me, he said, I'm supposed to spend my time imagineering. But the job isn't so much a matter of getting something new made. It's a matter of making it look like I'm getting something new made. 
You know what my work is? You know what I pay attention to? Covering my tracks and working through and just getting through another day. That's my work. Engineering is my job. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Cal spent the better part of every day, a good part of his energy, and the best part of his wonderful imagination, covering his tracks and just getting through another day. What's even sadder is that there are a lot of people whose lives are just like that. Their occupation isn't fulfilling. Getting up and going to work gets harder and harder. The feeling of being trapped stifles their spirits. And in a culture like ours where choice is the mantra, those who feel locked in to uncomfortable jobs are very unhappy people. This past year and a half of pandemic has certainly deepened the hardships and the unhappiness as positions have disappeared, as income has gone backwards, as living patterns have constricted drastically in many cases. But it is also created space to reconsider the difference between one's work and one's job. I hope that one of the lessons <clears throat> that this pandemic is teaching us is that finding meaning in one's work goes far beyond being gainfully employed, whether at home or out in the job market. You see, meaning and identity are siblings in this life. Meaning and identity are connected. Who we are is directly related to how we define ourselves. And how we define ourselves comes a great deal from the work we do for ourselves for our families and what we do for each other. And now we move back in to Paul's ethical message to the Romans. Fortunate indeed are those who have the luxury to consider such a thing as this. Sadly, far too many of us don't. The woman who has spent her entire young adult life as a mother caring for her children is suddenly faced with an identity crisis when those children move on into lives their own, of their own. If I'm not a mom, what am I, she says. A recent retiree finds his life in a shamble of disorganized activity. His routine over four decades of work has been changed. His former co-workers have not yet been replaced by new friends. And unfortunately, at this stage in his life, they never be. Loneliness is his closest companion. A 35-year-old has been slowly coming to the conclusion that this particular career he's in was a mistake, but for 10 years, he's been investing himself in it 
financial commitments and family responsibilities make life just a little bit difficult to even consider making a change. Stuck is his most operative word. A 51-year-old professional with a BS and an, M an MBA is cut loose from a major national firm after 27 years of stellar work for no other reason than to reduce managerial costs. He's now out on the hustings looking for employment and scared to death that he is aged out of the job market in his career. What do all of these folks have in common? A loss of identity and meaning that is directly related to one's work. So what is the corrective? The critical and painful task of reevaluating the meaning of life. For the non-Christian, there's not much help that the church can offer unless one is led into the community of faith by need or by example or by invitation. But for the Christian struggling with the meaning of his or her life, Paul offers those benchmarks that not only provide a guide for Christian living, they also give meaning to life, regardless of one's occupation. Eugene Peterson, in his biblical paraphrase, The Message, one of my favorite books that I keep on my shelf always. I've given it away and then had to go buy another one. It's just a great way to read scripture in a casual form. It says, it says this. He puts Paul's words into comfortable language. Paul says, here's what you do to add meaning and purpose to your life. You love sincerely. You don't play games with it. It's not something you buy or sell or trade. You hate what is evil and you cling like mad to what is good. You care for each other. You make a part of every day some time to check in with somebody else. Keep your perspective by looking out to others at least once a day. Just a phone call is all it takes. Give, give others a priority rather than yourself. Turn the lens around instead of woe is me what can I do for you? It's amazing how better you will feel about that. Give others that priority. Work hard and don't be lazy. William Barclay once said, Christians may burn out, but they should never rust out. Serve the Lord with a heart full of devotion. We seem to say these days, I really couldn't care less. The Christian, though, better not say that. We should be burning inside about others. Rejoice in hope. Do not despair, because to be a Christian is to be an optimist. Christians should be folks whose glass is always half full, never half empty. Be patient in your troubles. Someone once said to a gallant sufferer, you know, suffering covers, colors all life, all of life, doesn't it? And she turned and said, yeah, but I get to choose the color. Persevere in prayer. It's the connection to the divine that helps us stay grounded. Share with others in times of need. In a world bent on getting, the Christian is bent on giving. And you know, it's true. When we give to others, 
we always feel that we're the ones who get the best gift. Be hospitable to everybody. Christianity is the religion of the open hand, the open heart, and the open door. And it's all about the story that was shared with the kids this morning, that all of us got to overhear it. It's all about being kind and gentle with yourself and with others. You and I, as Christ's disciples, are supposed to be Imagineers, just like Cal, that, that metallurgical engineer in Louisville, but in a far better way than he was. We're supposed to imagine ourselves as a community of people who are working to find better ways to live the Christian life, regardless of our occupation. Our daily lives are to reflect our highest Christian priorities. For when they do, we are indeed growing in to the full stature of Jesus Christ. This pandemic is putting us to the test. Our politics are putting us to the test. But thanks be to God, our brother Paul has given us the keys to our true identity in Jesus Christ. And it can all be summed up in simply be kind and gentle and outward facing to others. And when we do, we are reflecting Jesus Christ to the world. And to God be the glory. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is 300. Let us stand. together. We affirm that our only comfort and life in it is, is the fact that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Christ. I am confident that he has fully paid all of my sins and has set me free from the tyranny. He watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in our morning prayer of the Lord's Prayer. Oh God, Paul makes it sound so easy. Just be sincere, determined, altruistic. And yet we find ourselves hesitant shifty and unreliable and selfish. He says just be zealous and hopeful and patient. But God, we often feel very tired and desperate and anxious. He tells us to be generous and hospitable and harmonious and yet, oh God, we find ourselves hoarding and isolating and discordant. We want to make good choices, but the world's options glitter, catching our eyes and our interests. And then way leads to way, dear God, until we've lost our way, until we feel overcome and alone and that's when we call out like now and you you every time toss a lifeline you are so reliable never damning us never announcing that you've saved us for the last time always casting away the darkness, always dismantling our disbelief, always throwing your loving arms around our shoulders, always and again loving us with mercy. You're so amazing. You banish our loneliness. You abide with us always, whether we're aware of it or not. You whisper loving assurances into our hearts and you lead us by the hand. You suffer with us. You redeem us from the pit. Hear our prayers, O oh God, this day for others, for sisters and brothers for whom our prayers for healing and wholeness are unending. Their names are still echoing in our minds. We read them in our worship guide and we hear them spoken in our presence. And so we pray for the sick, asking that you heal their bodies minister to their spirits and renew their minds. We pray for the grieving, asking that you comfort them in their loss and strengthen their hope. And we pray for all who feel they are struggling alone with matters of life that are overwhelming in Afghanistan, in Haiti, in firestorms and floods at borders around the world. Give courage, O oh God, and hope and perseverance 
and a clear sense of your presence in their lives, guiding those of us with the power to help, to help. All these things we ask and so much more through him who walked where we walked, struggled in ways much like ours, and who gave himself for us and our salvation. Your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray when we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As those, as those who recognize the saving work of Jesus Christ in our lives and in our world, our worship continues as we respond with thanksgiving to the word proclaimed and acted out as we offer to God the gifts of our heart and our hands. You all know how you are giving to support the life of this congregation, either online or by text and other methods that so many churches are using this day, and very helpful. So let us remember our gifts as we um, give them this day, and to God be the glory. <laughs> Son, Jesus Christ, bringing light and life to the way that you would have all of us live. May these gifts and our collective talents be used to quench the thirst of all with the living water that he offers. In his holy name we pray. Amen.
So go out into the world as Jesus Christ's brothers and sisters, growing into the stature of him who goes before us. And just be yourselves, be the people that God created you to be, and be kind to one another and to all whose paths you cross. And in so doing, you proclaim the gospel in ways without words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.